there is a tool that the devil and his minions use to keep people trapped in their cycle of evil. What is it? I'm Pastor Jason Barnett, and this is the Dirt Pastor Man Podcast. number estimates anywhere from 900,000 to 1 million people. What am I talking about? That is how many people the Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin had executed in 1937. See, when he came to power, he didn't want anybody that thought different than him. He didn't want anybody that might be a rival to him. He didn't want anybody that might offer up something different than the Communist Party. He did not let the Soviet Union be challenged at all. So what did he do? He rounded them all up and he executed them. Historians call that year the the Great Purge. Because Joseph Stalin purged his nation of anyone that might undermine him. Well, of course, Joseph Stalin, he passed away in 1953 and he was replaced by Nikita Khrushchev. And uh, Khrushchev, he would would condemn many of Stalin's practices and crimes. He would flat out call them what they were. And one time while Khrushchev was was criticizing his predecessor, a hector from the crowd spoke up and said, well, weren't you one of them? Couldn't you have done something? Khrushchev got quiet for a minute and he goes, who said that? In a real loud thundering voice. And a deathly silence fell over the entire room. No one, everyone was afraid to move or do anything. And that's when Khrushchev replied, that's why. Fear. Fear kept people from doing the right thing. Kept them from saying and doing the right things. You see, in the face of such evil, those who had the power to say or do something didn't do it because they were afraid. And it's in this fear that evil and the forces of darkness operate. Because people are afraid to say the truth and to do anything. Even here in the church. I'm not talking just this church, but the church in general. In our text today, we're going to read the fallout of Amnon raping his sister Tamar. It's a topic we don't talk about in church. We don't discuss it because it makes us uncomfortable. But it's one where our call to holiness remains. If we're to be holy people as God calls us to be, we have to discuss it. And parents, I want you to know something. I know we, we sent the kids out because I knew the topic of today's message. But it's very important that you don't neglect your job as a parent. Because this conversation still needs to happen with them. Hey, I know what you're thinking. Well, don't we, don't we have a school system that has these talks with them? Yes. But do you really want the school telling your kid what to believe about sex and how it's supposed to operate? It begins with you in your home. You have to be the one to have that conversation with them. As we look at our text today, our question is, as a holy people, what are we supposed to do facing such an evil situation? How are we going to respond? So with that question, mind, let's turn to 2 Samuel chapter 13, verses 15 through 22. Verse 15 reads, Then Amnon hated her with intense hatred. In fact, he hated her more than he had loved her. Amnon said to her, Get up and get out. No, she said to him, Sending you away would be a greater wrong than what you have already done to me. But he refused to listen to her. He called his personal servant and said, Get this woman out of her and bolt the door after her. So his servant put her out and bolted the door after her. She was wearing her rich seat woman in a robe. For this is the kind of the garment the virgin daughters of the king wore. Tamar put ashes on her head and tore the ornament and robe she was wearing. She put her hand on her head and went, up, went away, weeping the loudest she went. 
Her brother Absalom said to her, Has that Amnon, your brother, been with you? Be quiet now, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. And Tamar lived in her brother's household, a desolate woman. When King David heard all this, he was furious. Absalom never said a word to Amnon, either good or bad. He hated Amnon because he had disgraced his sister Tamar. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks God. be to God. Like I said, I'm not going to go into the details of the events that took place, but if you read the beginning of this chapter, Amnon puts an evil scheme into motion that works out, that ends up with him raping his sister Tamar. Verse 15 says that Amnon ended up hating Tamar more than he had loved her. And I've got news for you. He never really loved her. He may have thought he did, but when he saw her and saw how beautiful she was, it wasn't love that filled his heart. It was he saw an object that he wanted, and he would do anything to get it. And once he got that object he wanted, he used it like a filthy rag and then discarded it just the same. Why does he discard it so quickly? Because every time he looks at her, he's reminded that he is guilty of sin. And the, the best way for him to, to not feel that guilt was to get rid of her as fast as he could. So he wouldn't have to look at her anymore. Matter of fact, the, the, the law of God stated that if a man had done what Amnon did, he was supposed to go to the woman's father, pay 50 shekels of silver, repent of his sin, and then marry this woman and never divorce her. But see, Amnon was not interested in that, was he? He didn't truly love her. He just wanted to use her when he was done. He had no interest in protecting her, I, protecting her as a person. He had no interest in her as a person. He was done with her, so she just had to get out so he would not be reminded any more of his sin that he so he throws around the streets. Not only that, it was against the law of God for a man to sleep with his sister, even if she was his half-sister. It was illegal. Matter of fact, if, if, if he had been found out, then Amnon, even if he had married Tamar, they would be forced to leave their people. They would be cast aside. So rather than be found out, rather than be confronted with the sin and feel guilty over it, Amnon cast Tamar out. Tossed her out like a dirty rag. Abandoned, abandoned outside, Tamar is not ignorant to what's going on. She was raped by her brother. And in fact, she had gone into her brother to take care of him. She, she had been told that he was sick, that he wasn't feeling well. But it was all a con just to get her in the room alone with him. And that wasn't bad enough. Now Amnon was trying to attempt to shift the blame to Tamar. It was just the two of them alone in that room. Amnon had kicked everybody else out. He calls the servant to come back in, then he throws her out. So it was going to be her word versus his. And this is a culture where a woman was nothing more than a piece of property. Amnon, he was the first one of King David. He was the king's son, potentially the heir to the throne. And, she, and he, was, he had kicked her out such a way that the door was bolted behind her. So, so it would look like she was the one that instigated everything. Amnon set her up to look like the tramp in the whole story. And that was worse. So she tears the robe she was wearing. It's a robe that the virgin daughters of the king wore to show their purity and as a symbol of who, how beautiful and who they belong to. But she tears it because that, that wasn't her status anymore. She had been humiliated. Her innocence taken. She puts ashes on her head, mourning as if her life had ended. In many ways, in this time period, it was. It had. Just understand something. 
For the rest of her life, she would have to live in her brother Absalom's house. Her people would look at her as one that was unmarriable. She had been defiled already. She had, she had committed adultery with her own brother. So who would want to be with a woman like that? She would be unmarriable, unable to have children. She was forever bound to live with her shame. So while she might not have physically died, she was mourning the dreams of a life that would never be because her brother Amnon took them from her. And I'd like to say this is where the story gets better, but it doesn't. She goes out crying in the streets because that's all she has left to do. She's out crying, hoping that some, maybe somebody will hear her story, listen to her side, and maybe believe her. And she comes, and lo and behold, she runs into her brother Absalom. And this is what Absalom says to her. Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? Oh, be quiet now, my sister. Don't take this thing to heart. Are you kidding me? I mean, at first glance, you know, those first words of be quiet when it sounds like he's being, he's being a loving brother trying to console his sister. But when you read that part of, don't take this matter to heart, that reveals Absalom's true motives and everything. Yes, he is angry about what happened to Tamar. But he's also angry because this jeopardizes the family name. He also recognizes this as an opportunity for him to, to find his, play, his way to the throne. You see, Amnon was the firstborn. Guess who the secondborn son was? Absalom. So he tells his sister, be quiet, my sister. Don't take this man at heart because he doesn't want her wailing and crying in the streets loudly because he knows for the family name to be dishonored. And he also wants to be able to plot his path to the throne on his own. He says, at this point, if you're Absalom, you know it can only go one of two ways. David's going to find out about it. And he's going to punish Amnon by booting him out of the country, and then guess who's left? Or David's going to do nothing, now he has a reason to revolt against his dad. Absalom silences Tamar because his ambition is more important. Verse 21 tells us that King David hears about it. When we talk about King David, we're talking about the David that slew Goliath. We're talking about the David that, had, that is known as a man after God's own heart. And he, here he is sitting on the throne of the kingdom of God's people. And he finds out that his daughter has been raped. So surely he's going to do something, right? And verse 21 tells us he hears about it. And he is furious. He is outraged. He is angry just like any of us other parents in here would be. I'm telling you, if this happens to my daughter... We're going to have a little party with my friend Gage, who is 12, and we're going to go on a hunting mission. Be warned. <laughs> and I'm a medic, so I can put you back together and make it last a little longer. All right. <laughs> but David hears about this. He gets angry. The king, the one who actually has the judicial power to do something. I don't know what happens to my microphone, but I don't mean it. He actually had the power to do something. He could make a decision to, 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 on the outcome to punish Amnon, to put things right the best way he could for his daughter. And not only was he the king that has the judicial power, he's also the girl's father. So what a perfect combination for his anger as a dad and having the power to do something. But what does David do? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Why? Because Amnon's a son too. And boys will be boys. As Christians, we are called into holiness. As people call into holiness, what are we supposed to do in these situations? Well, if we're truly 
truly called a holiness, we're living a holy life that God calls us to, which if you don't believe that God calls us to holiness, read the Bible. It'll tell you throughout the pages of Scripture where God says, be holy as I am holy. That is not a suggestion. That's not a grand idea. That's not something that we wait for when we die. We are to be holy as God is holy right here, right now. And if we can do so through the power of the Holy Spirit living in us and through us. Amen. Holiness at its core is not about following all the rules. That's part of it. That's the outcome of holiness. But what holiness really is at its core is perfect love. Love in its purest form. It's love with no motives. It's love with no other hidden agendas. It's love pure. You do things simply because you love God and you love others. And we as Christians, we are called into holiness. And that is the holiness we are called to. We are called to love God and love others. And loving God can only properly be done by loving others. You cannot love God and hate your neighbor. You cannot love God and be rude to your neighbor. Now, the only way you can love God is by loving other people as you love yourself. Amnon did not love Tamar. He failed to do so. He looked at his own sister as a sex object. Pull her off of the shelf like a toy, used her, and then threw her out. That wasn't love. Mm-hmm. Absalom, he failed to love Tamar. Yes, Absalom listened to her. But then he silenced her, minimized the pain that she was going through, and then did nothing to help her. Did nothing to try and make the situation right. He doesn't even go to David and say, hey, my sister's been raped, do something. No, he puts it in his back pocket and sits on it for the right moment when he needs it. He failed to love his sister. David, he failed to love Tamar, his own daughter. I mean, he, was, he, was, he loved her enough to be outraged and upset by it, but not enough to actually do something. He had no excuses. He couldn't, he couldn't go on about how well if I tell somebody, what if the authorities don't do anything? He was the authority. He had the power. But he didn't love his own daughter enough to actually do something. Why? Because of fear. See, all these, all these things, all these men feared uh, the truth being revealed because it meant, meant they would lose something. And on it, the truth got out. He would lose his pathway to the throne. But he lost it anyway, didn't he? Because if you read on further in this story, Absalom finally does get his moment. And he takes his revenge and he kills his brother. And Amnon never makes it to the throne. Absalom, he wanted the throne. So he silences his sister, trying to protect his pathway there, trying to hide his ambitions, to use this for the right moment. But he never gets the throne, does he? He's going to rebel against David because David does nothing. And then he rallies David's people to his side and causes a big civil war in the nation. But it ends all up with Absalom with his hair stuck in a tree and stabbed in the heart with a bunch of spears. He doesn't get the throne. The very thing he feared to lose, he doesn't get anyway. David. He feared his son not being able to carry on the family name. He feared what it would do to his nation. But do you realize, is it him failing to tell the truth, them hiding and suppressing the truth, all of his fears became reality anyway. Ammon's killed, Absalom dies, and his country lies in tatters and torn, broken and destroyed. You see, if the truth had just been revealed, it could have altered all those outcomes, couldn't it have? God's grace could have intervened and worked in that element of truth, but fear denied the opportunity for grace to work. Whenever sexual abuse occurs, that is a sin against God. Not only is it a sin against God, but it is a sin against a fellow person. It does not matter what the victim was wearing. It does not matter where the victim is at.
The situation was not their fault. They were sinning against, they were a victim of somebody else's selfishness. Should we as believers encounter an incident happening, or when this happened, we discover it. The victim should be protected and supported by us. If nobody else, if nobody else in the world will care about them and listen to their story, we should be the ones to hear them out. We should be the ones that love them. Not give them saying, well, it's all going to be okay. Or, well, it really wasn't that bad. No, it, it was bad. And I'm not sure if it's else going to work out, but you know what? If you trust God, God can help you rise out of the situation. Yeah, that's right. But you're going to need some support along the way. I'm here for you. Failure to do so is a failure to love them. And failing to love them is to fall short of the glory of God. At the same time, if we know who the guilty person is and we hide that who that is, or if we know the truth and we refuse to share it, we are failing to love that other person that was their victim. And we are failing to love the person that is the perpetrator. Because obviously they are sick and there's something wrong with them. They need help. Oops, sorry. There's something wrong with them. But if we choose silent, we allow them to carry on in their sickness, not untreated, unconfronted in their sin, so they can continue on going on wrecking more and more lives. But see, love doesn't do that. What are we supposed to do in these situations? We are to be a holy people. Paul tells us in Corinthians, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. That means it, these situations are never easy. Because you will report, and then you are dependent upon the person above you to push the story on. And so many times you stop from doing it because you think, well, what if they don't hear us? What if they don't believe us? What if there's not enough evidence? Well, I've told them before they didn't do anything. That's fear talking. You're talking to remind you that the path where you're on to support this person is not going to be easy. It's not going to be quick and simple. Because sometimes loving somebody takes everything that you have. Sometimes you need a reputation. To keep silent about sexual abuse is to delight in evil. I'm not saying you run around saying, oh, yeah, yeah, evil's winning. The silence allows evil to endure and thrive in the shadows and create more fear. Love in these situations needs, needs to speak truth. Love does not harbor evil. Love exposes evil to truth. Not, not joyously. Not because it takes pleasure in pointing out the sins of others, the brokenness of situations. No. Love exposes evil to truth in hopes that God's grace can intervene and bring transformation to what evil meant for bad. God can build something beautiful out of. There's an old song that my youth group used to sing called uh, Beautiful Things. And it's a really weird sounding song. But the whole song is about God and these beautiful things. It, bring, it talks about how God will take ashes and make something beautiful grow up out of it. That happens when love exposes truth and allows grace to intervene. Rape, molestation, all forms of sexual abuse are sins. Sins that destroy, leaving shattered bits of humanity everywhere. It doesn't matter how you look at it. If it happens in your family and the truth comes out, it's going to destroy your family. If the truth is suppressed and hidden, it's, just, it's still destroying the lives of the people that are involved in the situation. In churches where it's suppressed and not talked about or trying to be covered up, when it does come out, it destroys that church forever. Don't believe me, look at just what just happened to Adam after eyes. Every time it happens, 
And it goes unchallenged, and, and, and people are kept quiet about it. It just leaves more shattered tears of people everywhere. But God's grace is big enough. You may not know this is a tangent, but you know how, maybe you know somebody that's Catholic or not. Maybe you don't know this, but Catholics have a thing against people being cremated, right? They don't want you to put in a little jar full of ashes. And if you think back to the Middle Ages, whenever it was, was someone was convicted of heresy or being a witch, remember, Sam of the what they do, they burn it at the stake. You know why? Because they believe that that if they made them into ashes, that they were too scattered and too separated for God to be able to put back together at the second coming. There's no body. Remember, when Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ shall rise. That means the body's going to be resurrected. So if you don't have a body, you can't be resurrected with your thought. The problem with that is they're not thinking and realizing that, that God is the God who formed us out of the dirt and breathed life into us. Do you really think that the God who created you out of the dirt knows the number of hairs in your head? Can't find every single one of yourselves and piece them back together. Silliness. I say that to say this. What those incidents do in destroying people, in destroying families, in destroying lives, in scattering bits of humanity everywhere, God's grace can find each and every single one of the pieces and put them back together. But we have to stop being afraid of the truth coming out. Grace needs to be joined by truth for love to prevail. Because in the end, that's what perfect, pure, and holy love is. It is always both grace and truth. So just a moment, I'm going to ask the worship team to come back up. I know this morning's message has been hard. But I believe that God's grace is enough. I believe God wants to heal someone. God wants to begin to help you pick up the pieces and put them back together. So maybe you came in here this morning and you've been silently carrying a burden of what happened to you. I'm here to tell you this morning, you don't have to carry it anymore. Come on, put that, 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 when the musicians come, they sing, as they sing their song, come and cry out to Jesus and he will hear you. And he will begin to help you pick up the pieces and bring healing to your life. Maybe you've been silent in fear about something, you know. This morning, as the, as the musicians sing, come to the Holy Spirit and find strength in him to be able to stand up and speak the truth because it needs to happen. Did you remain silent to save your family, your friend, your job, or even yourself? Well, this morning, if, even if you're a perpetrator or something like this, I want you to know something. God can forgive you. There is forgiveness available to you. So as this song plays, come to Jesus and find forgiveness in his name. This message was recorded live at the Greensburg Church of the Nazarene, located at 31 Bluebird Lane in Greensburg, Kentucky. Uh, to learn more about us or to let us know that you were listening, visit www.gbergnaz.com. Special thanks to Buzzsprout for hosting this week's episode. If you want more from the Dirt Path, please like our Facebook page.